it's a really good thing that we had a supersized newscast earlier because I want to get right to Michael Snyder, the culture blaster, bringing us some movie reviews, and I'm sure talking about the 49ers a little bit as well. Let's welcome him into the broadcast. It is Michael Snyder. He goes on a rainbow. Hi. Hey, um, Merry Christmas. We're right on the verge of the Yuletide explosion. I'm so excited. <laughs> I want to wish all of the listeners and obviously Mark and Courtney uh, aboard the uh, SS Minnow or wherever they are right now, <laughs> and you and your family, Albert, Tony, uh, the entire universe, uh, mm -hmm. a happy holidays. And, um, you know, happy day after winter solstice, everybody. Wait, wait, is that, is that a thing? It's a big weekend for the movies. There are films opening today in select markets. There's stuff on uh, streaming services and on Christmas. Christmas Day, Monday, there'll be more openings. So let's get to it. I have a supersized culture blast. Shall we begin? Bring it on, please. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, you know, with all these prestige movies during award season, let's lead with something decidedly mediocre. What do you say? All right. Why not? <laughs> okay. Not so much a glorified B movie as a, a shiny assembly line DC movie, uh, right, as in DC Comics. Yeah. Uh, Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom is a splashy, uh, often frantic and eye-catching, but ultimately soggy sequel to the uh, uh. decent Aquaman movie from a few years ago, um, which was directed by James Wan. And he's the guy who was the driving wheel of the Conjuring insidious and saw film franchises he's very comfortable in the horror realm and he did a good job in the first aquaman film which introduced jason momoa's jocular muscle-bound half human half atlantean superhero and it does like justice that. league <laughs> sorry <laughs> I mean, he's, you know, he's, he's well muscled. Uh, anyway, um, uh, Justice League member Arthur Curry, a.k.a. Aquaman, son of a lighthouse keeper and a royal queen of the undersea kingdom of Atlantis. So mm -hmm. Curry, by the way, no relation to another superhero, Steph Curry, uh, greatest shooter in basketball history. This Curry can swim like crazy, breathe underwater, wrestle a giant squid and telepathically command sea creatures uh, in Lost Kingdom, Momoa's um, likable Arthur is married to his equally oceanic sweetheart, Mera, played once more by Amber Heard. You know, even in the wake of that court issue with Johnny uh, Depp, you got to bring Amber Heard back as Mera. Of course. And, and they're the parents of a baby, Arthur Jr., who oh. is already showing signs of his genetic background by commanding the goldfish in his grandfather's fish tank to swim in unison like, you know, aquatic ballet dancers. Right. That's a very cute moment. Yeah, one very cute moment. Uh -oh. uh, there, there's an electric eel in paradise, Kim, and that's the villainous <laughs> Black Manta who gets a hold of a magical black trident, which he's going to use to ramp up global warming and pollution thereby destroying the world but most of all manta wants to torment aquaman by killing mara arthur jr and arthur's parents uh, again played by two very well regarded aussie actors uh, tamura morrison and a certain nicole kidman have you heard of her at all uh, maybe just a little bit Okay, uh, anyway, she plays Aquaman's mommy. Anyway, uh, all because Manta's evil father died in battle with Arthur. That's what this is all about. So to uh, have any chance of defeating Black Manta, Aquaman will have to free his imprisoned half-brother and former king of Atlantis, Orm, a nemesis in the previous Aqua movie, and played by another returnee, Patrick Wilson. So you got director Juan back at the helm of this gaudy ship, and there were a few rousing action sequences and creepy monsters, but a lot of overly busy high-tech computer game visuals that now border on tedious and kind of perfunctory, and a lot of weak humor and banter between Arthur and Orm. It's supposed to be funny, but eh. anyway. Only uh, Momoa, uh, Momoa's charm and the commitment of the superior actors, Wilson, Kidman, Morrison, 
uh, Yahya Abdul Mateen II as Black Manta and Randall Park as a Manta flunky. Uh, elevate this above disposable. Uh, by the way, um, this is the final movie in Warner Brothers DC Comics expanded cinematic universe that brought us the uh, tepid Justice League, Superman, Wonder Woman, and Flash films. And it's going out with a whatever, uh, and soon to be replaced <laughs> by a new attempt to out Marvel Marvel with a series of interlock movies overseen by filmmaker James Gunn of Guardians of the Galaxy and Suicide Squad fame, and starting with a Superman reboot, good luck, James Gunn, uh, Aquaman, and the Lost Kingdom is in theaters. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Um, the next movie that you have to tell us about is I'm trying to get it's to the, it. It's the color purple. We're going to like oh, play this right I'm, here. I'm excited about the color purple. I, I, I love I love the original movie, and I was wondering why they felt like they needed to remake it. But oh I my hear god, this... this is a question you've stolen. This question from oh. my brain, Kim. <laughs> okay. Did we need a movie musical of the color purple? Right. Alice Walker's beloved 1982 novel uh, exactly examining the struggles and triumphs of a group of close-knit black women, uh, one in particular, by the way, uh, in the American South during the early part of the 20th century. Did we need it? We already had this acclaimed dramatic movie of the novel in 1985, and that was followed by a Broadway musical version of the story in 2005, which has now been brought to the big screen by producers Oprah Winfrey, Mm -hmm. uh, who was in the cast of the uh, 1985 movie, and Steven Spielberg, who directed that first film. And damned if this movie musical isn't an inspiring version of Walker's book about sisterhood, survival, and redemption with some strong and soulful songs that are beautifully performed by the cast. And that cast, led by Fantasia Barino as the plucky Seely. Uh, who has to face challenge after challenge in her life, Taraji P. Henson, who I have loved since she was on Person of Interest on CBS, mm -hmm. uh, as the free-spirited, upwardly mobile Shug here, and Danielle Brooks as the abused but undaunted Sophia, and they uh, they act like crazy and sing the bejesus out of these songs. Wow. Um, the other players are also laudable. They include Coleman Domingo as the villainous but uh, pitiable master, and uh, I mean, it's a laundry list, but Corey Hawkins, Sierra uh, Anjanu Ellis Taylor, her, Halle Bailey, the uh, the girl who played the Little Mermaid in the recent oh, live yeah. action Little Mermaid, the great David Allen Greer, the uh, noble and wonderful Louis Gossett Jr., and John Batiste, who everybody loves, and you know he has a small role here, but he's pretty wonderful. And if this doesn't reach uh, the heights of the 1985 movie with Whoopi Goldberg and Oprah, I mean that's an awfully high bar. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you what. This revival, directed by Blitz Bazawu, uh, with spirit and <laughs> tenderness, uh, certainly uh, revived me. Um, uh, the, the Color Purple in theaters okay. on Christmas Day. Very cool. Let's talk about the Iron Claw. All right, all right, all right. In a remarkable feat of dramatization, director and screenwriter Sean Durkin took the true saga of the Von Erich pro wrestling clan and forged the Iron Claw, a constantly fascinating, surprising, and tragedy-tinged movie about aspiration, family dysfunction, and for better or worse, personal determination. In the 1980s, the intensely loyal Von Erich brothers were driven by their father, a former wrestler himself, to fight their way out of regional matches with the goal of doing what he never did, and that's win a national pro wrestling championship belt. As far as the movie itself, I was extremely impressed by Zach Efron from High School mm -hmm. Musical and me and Orson Welles. He's as we've never seen him before. His portrayal of brother uh, Kevin Von Erich is a marvel of sheer will and physical fury in the face of pain. And he is matched in intensity by Jeremy Allen White. That's right, Carmi from the Bear on FX as brother Kerry Von Erich. Uh, Harris Dickinson as brother David Von Erich and Holt McCallany as their domineering father, Fritz, who is the embodiment of toxic masculinity, uh, whose signature wrestling move, the Iron Claw, which gives the movie its name, mm -hmm. was passed down to his sons. Plus, you get the always excellent chameleon Lily James. That's right. From Downton Abbey 
to Pam and Tommy to the portrayal of Kevin's devoted uh, Midwestern style sweetheart and Maura Tierney as Doris Von Erich, long suffering wife to Fritz and mother to the boys. Uh, kudos to Durkin and his cast for the Iron Claw, a gut punch and a body slam of a movie uh, that may hurt your heart and should linger in your mind long after you see it. It's in theaters. And, uh, you know, it's not in my top 10 this year, but it's uh, among my favorite films of 2023. Does it have anything to do with the TV show he Heels? I, I have no idea. No idea? Okay, because it's also based on wrestling and a, a family with brothers that are involved in wrestling in another interesting uh, show. Um, that, that, about, that's interesting. Wait, 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 wait. That, that okay. smacks of they're so similar that it's got to be inspired by the Von Erichs, kind of, don't you think? Yeah, that's what I was thinking, but I'm not sure. So I'll have to look it up and see if there's any relation or any any connection there. Yeah, okay, let's, uh, let's drive forward. And I use the word drive that's specifically right. because... I'm talking about Ferrari, um, director Michael Mann's Ferrari, and that's his movie, not his car, uh, takes on the story of Italian sports car legend Enzo Ferrari, the ex-Formula One racer and head of Ferrari Motors, to tell a tale of ambition and obsession set in the early 50s. So Mann, for those who don't know, was the creator of the TV series Miami Vice, and he went on to direct Heat and Ali, among other memorable movies, and now he's got Ferrari. So motoring forward, get it? Motoring forward mm -hmm. through intimate scenes of familial strife and thrilling segments replete with the excitement and danger of racing. Ferrari ultimately satisfies regardless of its primary focus being only one significant slice of Ferrari's life. You know, for a biopic, that's pretty narrow, but, mm -hmm. but it works. Um, and that's largely due to the segments presenting propulsive action from the Formula One racing season of 1957. Um, in his second recent performance as a significant Italian figure, after his role in House of Gucci, Adam Driver does a better job of nailing an accent, believe me, uh, and delivering a measure of gravitas as Enzo Ferrari, whose marriage was shaken by tragedy and undermined by betrayal. Uh, but Driver is outdone by Penelope Cruz, the great Penelope Cruz. She offers a truly complex characterization as Enzo's wife, Laura, who, despite the hurt she felt at playing playing second fiddle to Enzo's mistress, here played by Shailene Woodley, uh, was an astute business mind and crucial to the success of the Ferrari company. Alas, that company is facing back bankruptcy in uh, 57, and Enzo is determined to risk it all by pushing his team on the racing circuit to win one major race, as treacherous as it might be. And if you'd like to see a man gambling with his life and livelihood while his employees gamble with their lives at high speeds, Ferrari will do the trick. It's in theaters on Christmas Day. Uh, yeah, flawed, but I thought pretty damn good. But Adam Driver's okay in this, huh? Yeah, you know, I mean, he's outdone in the, in some ways by Penelope Cruz. Sure, but he's he's solid in this thing. Okay. Um, all right, we got we got some quickies. Shall we get to some quickies? Yeah, bring it on. Okay, although it might be overlooked in the end of year torrent of high profile movies trolling for awards, mm -hmm. like I was saying earlier, the relatively modest memory is an emotionally volatile and moving showcase for two actors at the top of the craft, Jessica Chastain and Peter Sarsgaard. Uh, this is a mature tearjerker from writer and director Michelle Franco about the unexpected relationship between Sylvia a damaged woman, a recovering alcoholic, working for social services and parenting her daughter, and Saul, a man she encounters at their high school reunion. So Sylvia, obviously played by Chastain, is holding it together as best as she can. But Sarsgaard's Saul, with troubles of his own and a brother, uh, played by Josh Charles, desperately trying to help him, throws the delicate balance of Sylvia's life awry. Memory floats and sails and rattles on the strength of its leads, and they are mighty indeed. It's what we might call difficult viewing, but definitely rewarding memory in theaters this weekend. Select theaters, if you will. Okay. Uh, I hope for... Go ahead. No, you. No, you. Okay. I hope for more fireworks from Freud's last session, which is a dramatization of a possible series of encounters in London, England, between the father of psychiatry, Sigmund Freud, 
uh, ill, but trying to hang on to life for the sake of his daughter, Anna, and fantasy novelist C.S. Lewis dealing with fear and trauma as World War II ramps up around them all. Um, okay, you got the unimpeachable Anthony Hopkins as Freud and the fine British character lead Matthew Good as Lewis. So expectations were high, mm -hmm. but director and co-screenwriter Matthew Brown's movie didn't particularly move or enlighten me. And it was actually kind of drab, uh, like war-torn London looks in Freud's last session. That oh. said, you know, the, the, whenever Hopkins acts, it's a master class. So mm -hmm. it's almost enough to recommend it. It is in select theaters. It's called Memory. Um, okay, I've been waiting to, to see this movie for a couple of weeks. I finally caught up to it. Hold on to your wigs and keys. <laughs> Godzilla minus one. I mean, it's shocking when you consider the success and impact of recent American productions featuring the apex of Japanese monsters being, of course, Godzilla. Yeah. Godzilla minus one is a new blockbuster from Toho Studios in Japan, original home of the a gargantuan radioactive dino lizard. And it is arguably the best Godzilla movie since his debut in 1954's Godzilla. Oh, really. high praise. Nice. Right. Um, in the waning years of World War II in this film, a kamikaze pilot crashes near a Japanese encampment on an island in the Pacific and encounters a gigantic prehistoric lizard along with everyone else at the encampment. And, you know, chaos ensues. So after the war and in the wake of American atom bomb tests in the Pacific, the ex-pilot, disgraced and guilt-stricken because he survived the global conflict and never, you know, crashed into an American destroyer, tries to build a life for himself amid the ruins of Japan, and, and he finds himself as the father figure in a de facto nuclear family, but that dino lizard, presumably irradiated by the atomic explosions, has grown and lurks in the waters off Japan. So like, what if this enormous creature decides mm -hmm. to attack? Yeah, what if? Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, a group consisting of the ex-pilot, some fellow military vets and scientists may be the only hope for the salvation of their country and humanity. Director, screenwriter, and head of special effects, Takashi Yamazaki, has made a magnificent kaiju movie, kaiju being the Japanese word for these giant monsters. And this is a high point in the franchise. Uh, and by the way, he made this purportedly at a fraction of the Warner Brothers legendary pictures uh, monarch movies that feature oh. Godzilla and P yeah. uh, King Kong. This is uh, of genre. This is as good as it gets. It's in select theaters where it should be seen if you can uh, catch it. Anyone but you. A painfully predictable romantic comedy. <laughs> Short on laughs and long on silly mishaps. Anyone but you. It's middling fair for the for the holidays, only with little or no Christmas trappings. So here's the deal. Two attractive urbanites meet cute and sparks fly until the misunderstanding the very next day snuffs any possible romance. Months later, still sniping at one another, by the way, they have to try and act civil when they both attend a, a destination wedding in Australia. And to be fair, this hoo-ha is elevated by the teaming of Sydney Sweeney, uh, the feline cutie pie from TV's Euphoria and the White Lotus, and the sexy leather-clad focal point of the Rolling Stones' recent video promoting the song Angry, and square-jawed Glenn Powell from Top Gun Maverick and Devotion, and it renders it somewhat tolerable due to decent chemistry between the leads. Mm -hmm. But it fritters away their charm and the skills of an able supporting cast, including Dermot Mulroney, Rachel Griffiths, Brian Brown, wow. Michelle Hurd, and Alexandra Ship. Now, this is all the more disheartening since director and co-screenwriter Will Gluck has done so much better with the uh, snarky, uh, Emma Stone teen comedy Easy A, and those two recent uh, very good-natured and droll Peter Rabbit movies. Yeah, anyone but you is pretty much a throwaway that I just oh. kind of felt like throwing away. Uh, yeah. It's in theaters. The Teacher's Lounge. Ooh, 
Um, it's got this cinema verite feel to it. And The Teacher's Lounge is unquestionably one of the best foreign language movies of 2023 and Germany's Oscar entry. It is a superb depiction of the trials and tribulations of a good and dedicated first time high school teacher whose best intentions and desire to figure out who's responsible for a sequ uh, series of, uh, of thefts on campus lead to a firestorm of like anger and recrimination. Mm -hmm. So as her colleagues on the teaching staff, various school administrators, parents and students enter the fray, the truth of things remains elusive and the teacher finds herself fighting for her career and her honor on multiple fronts. I, at least one sudden shock left me stunned at the events of the teacher's lounge as they played out. Uh, praise due to director and co-screenwriter Ilker Katek, uh, actress Leonie Benish as Polish immigrant teacher uh, Karla Novak and the rest of the cast, including the kids who seem realer than real in the teacher's lounge. It'll be in select theaters on Christmas Day. Well, sounds like a good one. I might put that on my list. If um, you can get a hold of it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, now, okay. I had a couple of animated movies, you know, for oh, the whole Oh, yeah, family. yeah, yeah. Good, good. What do you say? Yeah, let's bring it. Migration. Okay, so I mentioned The White Lotus earlier because Sydney mm -hmm. Sweeney is in it. And Mike White, was the creator, uh, a writer director of that wonderful series and such terrific movies as School of Rock. And coincidentally, he co-wrote Migration, the new animated feature from Universal's Illumination Studios, home of Gru and the Minions, et cetera. So Migration is migration though. It, it won't uh -huh. make you wanna migrate out of the theater, but it is hardly up to White's witty standards that said, it's well animated and has some lively and amusing moments, but it's not any great shakes of a tail feather, you know. <laughs> um, here's the premise. A family of there. ducks. Here's a family of ducks. They're led by Father Mac. He is a mallard who wants to stay in their home pond rather than fly south for the winter. He's a little, you know, lazy. lazy. Yeah. yeah, he's lazy. <laughs> he's also... Yeah, he just doesn't want to endanger the family, I guess. Okay. Uh, but Ma Mama Duck Pam and the ducklings are eager to follow a friendly flock to sunny Jamaica. And along with their goofy Uncle Dan, they convince Dad to make the journey. That results in a series of misadventures in the treacherous concrete canyons of the big city and an encounter with a cleaver-wielding chef who has acquired a bunch of fowl with the intent of cooking them up at his high-end restaurant. The voice actors include uh, Kumal Nanjiani as Mac, Elizabeth Banks as Pam, Danny DeVito, that old st uh, scene stealer, even verbally as Uncle Dan, as well as Aquafina, Keegan Michael Key, Carol oh. Kane, and from Peep Show in the UK, David Mitchell. Migration will keep kids engaged and won't insult uh, adults. Uh, and that's about it. It's in theaters. Uh, I do have a better, better cartoon. Yeah, Chicken Run, Dawn of the Nugget. Okay, so 23 years after 2000's Chicken Run, a sequel arrives from England's Ardman Animation. And though it's not anywhere near as good as the first run, Chicken Run, Dawn of the Nugget is notably better than a couple of the more recent stop motion animated movies from Ardman, best known as home to the wonderful uh, Wallace and Gromit cartoons. Mm -hmm. So the chickens of the first movie escaped captivity and have built a society on an island where they're safe from humans who want to eat them. Anyway, <laughs> Ginger voiced by Tandaway Newton and Rocky, voiced by Zachary Levy, even have hatched a feisty little offspring. But on the nearby mainland, other chickens are endangered and Ginger and Rocky's kid is soon one of them, forcing the island chickens into action. So Chicken Run, Dawn of the Nugget, is fun much of the time and certainly visually stimulating. And it has a decent message about the cruelty of animal farming for mass consumption. Nonetheless, it falls short of the first chicken run, and I'm not chicken to say so, uh, even as a fan of many, though not all, of the Ardman animation projects. But it is better and more interesting than Migration, with which it shares some plot elements, as should be audible, you know, uh, the endangered potential dinner situation, which is uh, ongoing in both movies. Um, the thing about Chicken Run is uh, it's in theaters and streaming now, so if you want to see it, you can just jump right on in. Well, it's it's winter break, so a lot of people have their kids home. So this this movie might do very well as people look for something new to watch. It's 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 worth checking out with the family. Absolutely.
Something else we have coming up. This is on TV on Christmas Day. I think it's the 49ers playing. Oh, my God. So <laughs> I am preparing to either, you know, usually you, you want to dine out on Christmas Day with the, your your friends or go to someone's house. I am just going to get some, I don't know, Korean chicken wings and a spinach salad and plop myself down and watch 49ers Ravens, the two top records in the NFL, uh, the AFC leader being the Ravens and the NFC leader being our 49ers. And it's yeah. going to be a titanic battle that might be a preview of the Super Bowl. And uh, I would like uh, Brock Purdy and company to continue quieting the doubters on Monday night with a, uh, a handy victory over the Baltimore Ravens, getting a small measure of revenge for the Niners Ravens Super Bowl that didn't go our way. And hopefully, hopefully previewing another Niners victory come Super Bowl time. I got my fingers crossed. Any TV series we should be looking at for for the week ahead? Shalhoub, the TV series. I never watched it. It's so entertaining. Tony mm-hmm. Shalhoub plays a incredibly neurotic detective who is brilliant and incisive. Uh, like if Columbo had every manner of tics and OCD and didn't right. have a wipe and was sort of a misanthrope, that's Monk. And, yeah. and you know, the last episode aired over a decade ago. And Tony Shalhoub, of course, has been on the marvelous Mrs. Maisel and, and other sure. um, TV programs and movies. And Peacock just dropped about a week or so, uh, or so ago, Mr. Monk's Last Case, a Monk movie, which brings back most of the principal actors from the TV series in a very entertaining movie-length uh, mystery. Uh, so you get Ted Levine as uh, Captain Stottlemyre, you get Trailer Howard as Monk's assistant, uh, and various other um Uh, actors show up, uh, pay their respects to Tony and the project by being in it. And I was, I entertain, uh, yeah, it it diverted me for an hour and a half. And uh, one more, one more quick note, Reacher uh, about the hulking uh, do-gooder and former army man who uh, just travels the country writing wrongs is back with the second season featuring the massive Alan Richardson as the uh, noble um, hobo of sorts, uh, mm-hmm. Reacher, and man, uh, you don't want to mess with this guy. He is a mountain of a human being, and these uh, Reacher uh, shows are wonderful, and it was so weird to me that the Reacher movie that came out featured diminutive Tom Cruise as the title character. Yeah, You'd have to like, this guy, Alan Richson, looks like he's eaten a couple of Tom Cruises. That's how big he is. <laughs> awesome. Michael Snyder, thank you for your support of the show all year, for being part of everything. You're awesome. Have a great holiday weekend and go 49ers. You too, Kim. And, and uh, you know, season's greetings to everybody. We'll catch you next week. Thanks, Michael Snyder. He comes and goes on a rainbow. Bye-bye, everybody.